supported. All right, about CSG very quickly, you can see our mission statement uh, right here. I will not read it to you, but essentially it has been a vision for a network of inclusive walkable transit-oriented communities for our region at our metro stations, purple line stations, bus rapid transit, commuter rail, uh, as the best way for us to grow. We were founded in 97, but stand on the shoulders of people in the decade prior to that. And next year's our 25th anniversary. We're really excited about that. Uh, we plan to join us for a big party in late April, early May next year. The date is to be set in that time period. Um, we just completed our Smart Growth Social Goes Local series for the fall. Thank you to all the people who joined us for those five events, all sorts of events in a park, on a walking tour, on top of a new building in Tyson's Corner within walking distance of the Metro at a brewery. Um, so in a, at a streetery site in Cleveland Park in DC and on the waterfront in Alexandria. Um, we are spending a lot of time on uh, the range of issues from affordable housing to transit oriented development, but certainly transit is a top priority for us through better buses campaigns at the regional level and in places like Montgomery County. We are thrilled by the dash bus redesign in um, Alexandria and we are encouraging Metro and all of our agencies to do a major bus network redesign, to uh, expand dedicated bus lanes, to make fares more affordable. Uh, so a pretty big agenda. Obviously, there's more work to do at Metro, Metro Rail, uh, including we need better communications from them. And certainly we need to find out what's going on with the 7,000 series and whether the ongoing maintenance and safety issues, what they are and how they need to be fixed. Look for a release uh, later this week of Metro Now's dispatch that we contribute to. Now, let me move next to our friends at Island Press, our co-host, oh, sorry, I'm, here's the staff real quickly. I'll just show you who we have on board, including two senior policy fellows who are uh, part-time with us. Uh, and here's, here is our core team. And we'll share the presentation afterwards so you can know who our core team is. And Island Press is a 501c3, just like uh, our organization. Um, here's the full description. You can learn more about them on their site. They really are the conservation and smart growth uh, uh, public policy press that we have on our side. There are other great publications and publishers out there, but these folks are really focused on helping change the world with the rest of us. And there's amazing series of books, not only Christoph's, but it's kind of getting ridiculous how many of these I've got here. Um, there's, that's where all my all my allowance goes to, uh, to Island Press Books, and I highly recommend uh, you go there and not only buy Christoph's book, buy other books. And by the way, you can buy Christoph's book uh, for 30% off using the webinar code at islandpress.org. Here you have his bio. Uh, again, we were thrilled to have him join us in 2019 on release of his first book, and I'd learned about Christoph a little before that. Many of you may have known or heard about the Houston Bus Network redesign. Well, as a board member, uh, at Houston Metro, he really was the inspiration and, and uh, uh, the leader behind this effort in Houston. Uh, it really put uh, bus network redesign on the map for everybody. Uh, Jarrett Walker Associates did the project. Uh, they're also the ones who did Richmond's uh, bus network, uh, the Dash bus network in Alexandria and many others across the country. Uh, I, looking at, uh, Christoph's bio, he's an engineer, he works for a planning firm, he teaches uh, at Rice, um, and then you look at his civic involvement, it's all over the map. So he's, I don't know how he has enough time. He's actually coming to us right now from Irvine, California on a consulting gigs, which he's scheduled around being able here, to be here for us today. So um, he's gonna put his bio, additional bio information in the chat for you. Uh, I really am thrilled to have him here, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing him in person sometime in 2022. Um, and he's going to tell us and share with us his latest thinking on trains, buses, and people, and where we are today with transit. So everybody, please welcome uh, Christoph. And right now, and you can put some claps in your, on your Zoom. I'm going to stop sharing, and we're going to let Christoph share his presentation now. So. Welcome, Christoph. Greetings. Um, so I'm here to talk about trains, buses, and people. Um, 
and um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A afterwards. So this is the second edition of the book. And what the book is, is it takes every metropolitan area that has rail transit or BRT, it maps them all at the same scale to show you what the infrastructure and the network looks like. It also maps the demographics all at the same scale, including an overlay of which areas are served by frequent transit service, a bus or a train every 15 minutes or better all day, um, at least five days a week. And the new book goes beyond the first in that it now covers not just the United States, but Canada. That's 57 different metro areas. And for every one of those, in addition to the mapping, vital stats on the networks that they have and the story of what decisions did that metro area make about transit? Why did they make those decisions and how did those decisions work out? It's basically a whole series of case studies of different metropolitan areas and how their transit systems operate. And in addition to that, at the beginning of the book, um, there are sections on the basics of transit. How do alignments work? How does governance work? How do we collect fares? Um, and a rundown of what makes for successful transit. Um, and new in I've also been able to work with Remix to get much better data. It not only helped in updating the frequent transit networks, but also led to the ability to talk about what percentage of the population of each of these metro areas is actually served by frequent transit. So last time around I, I spoke here, I um, talked about sort of what the basics are of what makes successful transit. And I think those are worth reiterating. We start with density. The more people live around transit, the more useful transit is, which means that good transit is built to where density is. And it means we can actually make transit better by adding more density around transit that already exists. Secondly, activity, because it's not just about where people live, it's where they work. Successful transit connects activity centers together, and that's downtown districts, it's other employment districts, it's universities, and successful transit serves all the trips we make over the course of a day, not just the home to work trip, but everything else we do. And successful transit is there every day for all of those different kinds of jobs, including all of the jobs that don't fit into a nine to five, five day a week schedule. Thirdly, walkability, there is no successful transit system in the United States, no high ridership transit system in the United States that gets a, a majority of its ridership from park and ride. Um, and even in a park and ride network, every transit rider is a pedestrian or a bicyclist on at least one end of their trip. So successful transit is incorporated into a walkable urban fabric because transit is a door-to-door -door experience, not a stop-to-stop -stop or station-to-station -station experience. Successful transit lines are also integrated into a larger network. No rail line, no BRT line, no bus route is a standalone. And successful routes are those that set up good connections to other transit routes and function as part of a larger integrated network. Good transit is frequent. Um, everyone who's trying to rely on the DC Metro right now is experiencing just how important frequency is. Um, the difference between something that comes every five minutes or something that comes every 15 minutes or something that comes every 30 minutes or something that comes every hour is huge. Um, and it's probably the biggest factor in sort of whether transit feels like it gives you freedom, as Gerald Walker says, or whether you find that transit is something that limits your life. Um, you know, we all know the experience of if you're on an hourly route, you may have a choice of being five minutes late or 55 minutes early. You literally have to plan your life around the transit rather than the transit being there for you when you need it. Travel time obviously matters as well, but what I always emphasize here is this is door-to-door -door travel time. Um, so simply making the vehicle faster doesn't help. Um, if it gives you a longer walk at the other end of the trip. We really have to think about every component in that trip. And as much as we think about travel time, we also need to think about reliability because unreliable transit is what loses you your job. If you can't rely on transit getting you there when it promised to get you there, you simply can't rely on transit. 
capacity matters, and we see in some places, and DC is one of them, that we have cases where transit routes are really at their limits of their capacity. Um, heavy rail lines that can't take any more train frequency, bus routes, which are running so many buses that you simply can't run reliable operations. So good transit provides the capacity we need. And then legibility. Um, I love this picture as an example. This is LA. Um, you can see your destination at the end of the street. You can see the path that gets you there. You can see the train station. You can see where the train is going. A good transit system is easy to understand. And something I really feel like I, I missed in the first edition, um, and I talked about last time already and really made sure to include in this edition is good transit is inclusive. Good transit welcomes everybody. Um, and that covers a whole lot of things. Um, it means when we have to think about race, it means we have to think about people who have been excluded from the transit systems. And we need to think about how the transit decisions we make have different impacts on different people. I think a really good example of that is the use of police for fair enforcement, because we all know that a police presence doesn't have the same effect on everybody. Um, you know, that if I'm a middle class white person, I, that's a very different experience I have to have my um, fare checked by an armed police officer than if I were Black or Hispanic or from a neighborhood that has a history of over-policing. But this covers other things as well. This is things like, are our systems wheelchair accessible? How do we handle it when that elevator is out? It covers things like, how do we do stroller policies? If you're expected to fold your stroller to board the bus, it makes transit a lot harder to use if you're traveling with a family. So the thing about this list is, if you ride transit, you actually know all of this stuff. None of this is that complicated. And I would argue that fundamentally transit planning is actually quite simple. Um, but one of the cases I make in the book is we're not very good at this. That if you look at transit around the United States and true in Canada as well, um, you can see we're often not making the right decisions. Here you can see a map of rail lines that are literally dodging dense areas, almost like airliners navigating around thunderstorms. Um, obviously not going to where the people are. Um, and so one of the things I talked about in the last talk is what we get wrong, but I also wanna talk about what can we do right? Um, how do we create better transit so that people really have access to everything that they need in life? And here's what I think we do to get there. Step number one is we really need to expand our frequent networks. We need that all day show up and go service serving as many people as possible. Frequency makes such a huge difference in travel time. It makes such a huge difference in the experience. And like I said, we all know what it feels like to be on the wrong side of that equation. We all know what it feels like to be waiting forever for that next bus or train. I actually map in the book what the footprints of frequent transit are in every one of these metro areas and looking at what percentage of people are served. And you can see the enormous range. Here is the North American champion Vancouver. 66% of the residents of the Vancouver metro area are within walking distance of frequent transit. New York City, 43%. You can notice some notable holes in Long Island and New Jersey on this map. 37% in San Diego. Now that's a city you don't think of as a transit city, but it's really outperforming in terms of giving people frequent service. Um, Salt Lake City at 28%, 22% for Los Angeles. Again, the suburbs are what's driving this number down. 17% for the San Francisco Bay Area, 17% for DC and Baltimore. You look at this map and you can see some real gaps. That number ought to be higher. 16% uh, for Houston. And, and again, land use wise, Baltimore and DC should be a lot easier to do here. 14% for Boston, where I'm currently helping redesign that network, 14% in Arizona, 13% in El Paso, Texas, and down near the bottom of the list, 3% in Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, one thing that really comes across in this book is how well Canada does at this. Every one of the Canadian cities outperforms their peers. And a big part of that reason is the Canadian cities have really good frequent service footprints. Basically, if you live within the city limits of 
Toronto, you are within walking distance of frequent transit. I wish we could make that statement for the city limits of Washington, D.C. And it's not just the frequent transit. The Canadian cities also do a really good job of just general coverage, making sure that everybody has access to transit service. And this means we need to have different kinds of discussions. Um, this isn't just about paying for building new stuff. It's about making sure we have reliable funding sources for operating all of that stuff. Next, we need dedicated lanes. We all know what it feels like to be on a bus that's stuck in traffic. And frankly, we build way too many of those. Um, and so what can we do to really get transit out of traffic? We've seen some really quick um, strategic solutions like New York City converting streets into busways, but we're also seeing more and more cities really do the gold standard version of this, which is median running bus lanes, bus lanes which are not impacted by park, which are not impacted by driveways, which are not impacted by right turns. Um, you see places like San Diego building suburban BRT. Um, you see Indianapolis, which built not only just a great BRT line, but did it at relatively low cost and really quickly by repurposing existing streets rather than completely rebuilding them. Um, you have Oakland, California with the new Tempo BRT, um, and you're starting to see larger cities see this as a good way to feed into their networks. This is Montreal um, building a BRT line that will connect into a Montreal metro station. But in some cases, simple frequent bus service isn't enough, and that's where we really need to talk about rail and BRT. Where it makes sense to invest in those highest capacity modes is the places where the ridership is highest. And that sounds like a really obvious statement, but actually that's not how we plan transit. Essentially what I would argue is that rail and BRT should be the spines of a network. Here you can see a map of the bus network. The thin lines are bus routes, the thick lines are rapid transit, and the color coding shows which bus routes feed into which line. So a red line, bus route on here is a bus route that feeds into the red line and only the red line. And you can see how the entire Boston bus network basically functions as tributaries of that rapid transit network, which gives a lot more people the benefits of the speed and of the frequency and of the reliability of that rapid transit network. And, and this goes to the point of the most essential transit planning decision we make is not the details of alignment. It is which corridors we choose to serve. Um, and you can see how that philosophy has changed over time, that before World War II, um, transit systems tended to not go very far out. They tended to have closely spaced stations and walkable neighborhoods. You can see Philly at upper left. And then you can see the kind of dramatic change post-World War II, where you had systems like MARTA and Atlanta, which were about making trips to the suburbs as quickly, as fast as possible, suburban lots, a lot fewer urban stations. And the sort of light rail systems of the 80s and 90s largely continued that thinking. I think what you're starting to see now is cities really plan for light rail lines that are integrated with their bus networks that um, serve those inner core neighborhoods. And thinking about how bus and rail works together. Are these duplicating overlapping networks or are they complementary networks like rail maybe being the radial line that goes into downtown and bus providing cross town service that makes multiple connections to that rail network so that all of those trips work. And you can really see the difference when you look at cities. Here's Denver, for example, and you can see their rail system, their bus system, like yeah, they're connection points, but they largely overlay on each other rather than form an integrated system. And um, for the most part, that rail system is serving a different set of riders than the bus system is um, and not really helping those bus riders, as opposed to when you look at Houston, where you can see rail lines that are fed by lots of bus routes where a bus into a rail line will be your most direct path into downtown or into the medical center. And, and this also includes the fact that we've tended to prioritize investments in the wrong places. Here's Denver again, Colfax, 10 and a half miles with 125,000 people within half a mile, 22,000 riders a day. And those riders right now are in a local bus stuck in traffic. Or we can look at the southern end of the light rail system, eight and three quarters miles, obviously considerably more expensive to build than a bus in mixed traffic. 
only about nine, 10,000 people within half a mile getting only about 8,000 riders a day. This feels like the wrong set of priorities. We should be using rail where we need that capacity. Um, none of you obviously will be surprised that that Southern Light Rail Line is serving areas which are considerably more white and considerably more affluent than the areas served by the Colfax bus. Um, essentially, I you can think of transit from a capacity standpoint and say the reason to go to BRT and the reason to go to light rail is actually getting better capacity out of those corridors. And you can see some cities that are doing this well. Vancouver, for example, is building a subway along the route of the busiest bus route in North America, a place where they're running buses at better than two minute frequency and still leaving people behind because those buses are too full. That's exactly the kind of place where it's worth investing in tunnels. Um, and you can start seeing cities really planning their networks around this thinking. Austin, for example, whose light rail and BRT network really will be confined to the core um, and which is designed as an integrated system along with their bus routes. And you can also see a lot of these newer systems do a much better job of serving all of the different kinds of destinations. Transit shouldn't just be about getting to work, it should be about getting to all of the things we need in life. And we should also be thinking about um, modernizing and improving the existing transit systems we have in places like New York, for example. It's a, it, it's not nearly as good a system as it ought to be. And if you look around the world at even places like Paris and the degree to which they have modernized those to work much more effectively and be much more accessible and much more customer friendly, we need to be thinking about those existing transit lines that carry so many people in the United States. But we don't just need to think about the urban core. Um, we should be thinking out into the suburbs um, and especially the places we kind of think of as suburban, but that really have taken on a lot of the kind of density, the kind of mixed use, the kind of diversity that we thought of the urban core as having. Um, I mean, you can look into Maryland, you can look into DC and you, you see a lot of that. Um, we, we, transit has always been good at serving downtown cores. We've been good at serving universities. We've been um, good at serving medical centers. Um, and we've been good at serving sort of the old streetcar suburbs. But a lot of the density that we have now actually takes forms like 1970s apartment complexes. There's a lot of ridership demand there, urban form that can be retrofitted to be more walkable. We need to think about how we provide that transit. Um, and that goes along with the fact that if we look at where low income residents live, they're considerably more spread out than they used to be. So that transit is an essential lifeline. Um, and serving the suburbs does not mean car-oriented transit. It does not mean putting transit stations randomly in the middle of industrial neighborhoods. It actually has to be effective, walkable, frequent transit. Um, because if you look at our track record, a lot of the quote unquote TOD we've done has not actually helped transit ridership because if the transit isn't high right, isn't useful enough, and the mix of uses in the TOD doesn't really encourage people to use transit for all of their trips, the ridership won't be there. And there's some good examples of this, BRT in a suburban employment center in Houston, but the best example in North America is Vancouver, a city which has utterly transformed itself around frequent automated transit. Those clusters of high rises represent SkyTrain stations. And at those stations, what they're redoing is they're taking single story retail surrounded by single family neighborhoods and building it up to 15 or 30 story mixed use. Um, and that's not just one station, that's station after station and integrated in a way that really serves people's everyday needs like the Safeway store. And once we serve the suburbs, we also need to think about city to city trips. Um, our, Network is great in a handful of places, um, Sacramento to San Francisco, the Northeast Corridor, but really drops off beyond that. We can do a lot better job of integrating Amtrak and commuter rail like they have in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, but we shouldn't just be thinking about trains. I think intercity buses hold a lot of promise and I can really see states and transit agencies playing more of a role in that. Um, and you know, things like freeway express buses can be part of the solution to this. And we really also need to think about um, 
rural transit. Small towns need good transit service too and need to be connected to the larger network. And then when we do that, we need to integrate all of that together, create seamless connections. Um, those buses and those trains should function together, which means we need to think about the physical integration of those networks, something Toronto does brilliantly where every one of their subway stations is really also a bus or a streetcar hub, including things like this. This is an underground transfer between bus and streetcar into the Metro. Like compare this to the experience of getting off the streetcar at Union Station into the Metro station. Think about what a different world this represents. And that allows Toronto to really integrate its bus and rail networks. You can see how that bus grid feeds into those rail lines and again gives people the advantage of those connections. There's good examples across the country. Here's a commuter rail bus station in um, Utah. Um, and there's great examples from around the world. This is a subway station in Munich, Germany with light rail and buses running directly into a canopy that's directly on top of the station entrance also means we need to think about how fares work and how we integrate fares. It means we need to have discussions about governance. It doesn't mean we have to merge all the agencies together, but we at least have to create mechanisms so those agencies work together. Um, and once we talk about governance, it also means we have to deal with some of the underlying political issues. And often those also include issues of race, where in Atlanta, for example, it's quite obvious the reason why some counties chose to have their own transit agencies is because those counties are largely white and did not want to be grouped in with the much more heavily black urban poor. And we need to make all of this easier to understand and use. I, I think we totally underestimate how much difference good system maps, good wayfinding, good integration of those networks makes. And you can see some really good examples like SEPTA in Philadelphia, rethinking the designation of lines and rethinking the mapping and the wayfinding across the entire network to take these different lines they inherited from different private operators and actually turn them into one system. So, that to me is what we can do. There are huge opportunities across the United States in metro area after metro area to truly make transit better. Um, but I would say the starting point of all of that should actually be this. We spend a lot of time talking about trains and buses, but if we really want to make better transit, we not, need to talk about people. We need to talk about how good transit can actually make people's lives better. And with that, I am looking forward to the Q&A. Um, contact information up here. Follow me on Twitter for at Christoph Spieler if you like seeing transit photos and lots of opinionated transit discussion. And as mentioned, um, here is a discount code um, for buying the book on Island Press. Well, thank you, Christoph. We really appreciate that presentation. Uh, at a time when so many things seem tough. I feel hopeful and inspired by your talk. Um, and, you know, judging from your talk and your previous edition of this, it is truly an encyclopedia that with a wealth of helpful information, just like we've heard here uh, in your presentation. So thank you. Uh, folks, we are going to go into Q&A and I'll start with the questions in the chat, but you can also raise your hand. Uh, Christoph will stop sharing his screen in just a second here. Make sure you've got your Island Press webinar code and, and be, be sure to get your 30% discount on his, on his book. Uh, so the uh, first question I saw came from, uh, came from Zach and it refers back to um, the, the percentage of people that were lived close to or had access to high frequency transit. And it's probably shocking to many of us that it's only 17% in the DC region, uh, despite a significant wealth of transit and a lot of progress we've made on transit oriented development. Uh, so Zach's question is whether DC has a low percentage because the frequent routes don't go to where the dense areas are or because there's not enough density near the transit. <laughs> well, I mean, both, I mean, from a simple mathematical standpoint, it's both. Um, what I would say if I compare DC to other areas, um, DC actually has a good amount of density. And, and I will note for the number for the book, um, the Census Bureau combines DC and Baltimore. So that number is a combined DC and Baltimore number. Um, and Baltimore, I would say is actually doing a little better than the DC end of the region in this number. Um, but 
fundamentally, in terms of land use, there is actually a lot of density, and that density extends beyond the traditional urban cores. There is a lot of density in Virginia and in Maryland, not just in the district. Um, what really the difference is, if I compare DC to some of its peers that are doing better, is not enough frequent routes. Um, and I think that comes from a history of probably paying too much attention to the rail network, which is an amazing network. I, I, I say lots of positive things about DC Metro in, in the book, and I think it's a network that actually has a huge potential to act as the spine for a much better bus network. But the bus service, there simply isn't enough of it. Um, and I would say it actually even gets a little worse due to the lack of integration in bus service and rail service that if you look at the service WMATA is operating in the district, a lot of it is effectively duplicating rail lines and it has to because the fares are different. Um, so they really can't fully connect because there isn't a fully integrated fare system. But fundamentally it's about more service. The problem is you need more service. Well, this uh, prompts me to talk about something I was going to wait till the end to talk about. Uh, for those who don't know, there was a bus transformation project spearheaded by WMATA in 2018 and 2019. Um, our group Metro Now with the business community is about to do a, a report card on where they are. Obviously, the pandemic has set them back on that. But what Christoph is reinforcing is I think the findings from that study as well. We don't have enough bus service. We don't have enough frequent bus service. We haven't paid as much attention to it. It does prompt uh, a question for me, Christoph, in terms of what your recommendation would be for Metro in particular. You know, they've had high fares on the rail system, which has discouraged lower income riders from, uh, and, uh, from being able to use it. Um, and yet they also do feed a lot of bus service into the rail system. Um, they're they're cross-subsidizing the full system and operating costs by getting massive fare box recovery from the Metro rail, or at least pre-pandemic they were. How do you solve that? You, you know, if you're cutting the metro rail fares that have been cross subsidizing, where do you find the money? I mean, I think one of the bottom lines for transit discussions is we can afford it. Um, that, that there's, given our economic strength and the economic strength of regions like DC and Baltimore, we can absolutely afford it. It's a decision of what our priorities are. Um, and you simply need to look at where transportation dollars are going you know there's a lot of transportation dollars going to highway expansions in maryland and 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 in virginia um so if we as a society believe this stuff is important we can figure out how to pay for it um and it is absolutely the job of the politicians to think through those mechanisms but i think it is our job as the public and advocates to simply demand better um and reliable operating funds are so incredibly important. Um, having, being able to operate the level of service that we need and being able to count on that and it not being a political fight every couple of years is just so, so important to this. And you're right, I mean, in a lot of ways, focus on fare box recovery, I mean, in some ways you can say that's a good thing. It, it means, the, you know, the, the it, it means an agency is operating efficiently, but it also holds us back from making systems more equitable. And it gets us in real trouble when things like COVID hit. Um, I mean, it doesn't, we don't necessarily need to change the fares for everyone. I could totally see how low income fare programs could help here. But I would say that if you look at the sort of gold practice of this about what some of the best metro areas in the world do, it's like, if you, if you, ride, if you ride in Munich, the fare between point A and point B is exactly the same, regardless of which mode you're riding on, whether you're riding commuter rail or subway or streetcar or bus, regardless of whether you're transferring or not, or re and regardless of which operator you use. Like that to me is how we should think of a transit system. And once you do that, you have the opportunity to integrate everything. Um, and like I said, not have to run redundant services that overlap on top of each other. All right, thank you. Going in a different uh, direction, uh, Daniel uh, Evans asked, uh, noted that various mobility data sources such as Streetlight and Replica have emerged over the last several years. How helpful uh, is this mobility data for informing transit service planning? Uh, and how can be best leveraged to help with transit planning? I think there's an amazing potential here. I mean, first of all, we shouldn't overthink data. Um, 
a lot of transit planning is common sense. And, and sometimes we've actually gotten ourselves in a trap by over optimizing, you know, like we don't need to run the 1232 bus because our load on that bus is lower than the 1245 bus. Like, I, I think there is such, such a thing as going too far with data, but what data like Streetlight has enabled us to do, and I've actually been part of watching this being used in Boston, is to look at trips we weren't looking at before. Um, a lot of transit planning in the past focused only on current transit ridership. And what it missed is those trips that transit wasn't serving well and therefore people weren't making on transit. Um, so that kind of trip data lets us find the trips that we were ignoring and then see that actually, yes, there is a sufficient volume of those in some places that it justifies much better service. And, you know, it's like the ridership on an hourly bus route doesn't actually tell you what the ridership would be if that route ran every 10 minutes. Um, that in some cases, the ridership is low because the service is bad. And I, and I think data like that can help. The other thing I found really interesting about it is it does a much better job of picking up non-home to work trips which are actually an incredibly important, that, that's three quarters of trips or actually more than three quarters of trips. And if we use it well, it can actually do a much better analysis of equity than we did before either. Because what we've always gotten wrong when it comes to equity analysis is we've treated it purely geographically. We've said, this neighborhood is low income, therefore the bus route in this neighborhood serves low income riders. But that doesn't really make sense because low income riders don't only travel in their own neighborhood. They have to, have to travel to their job and their job may actually be in a high income neighborhood. And it makes no sense to say that that bus route isn't benefiting low income residents because it runs through a high income neighborhood if that's what gets them to their job. And so being able to, actually being able to use this data to understand sort of the level of trip chaining and what people's actual destinations are can also lead us to making much better decisions. Well, this the next question sort of follows a little bit on, on what's happening in terms of the thinking about um, the types of trips we need to serve. Lisa Guthrie from the Virginia Transit Association asks uh, about um, the rethinking that may be going on in terms of trip destinations post COVID where telecommuting will continue. How does that factor in the need for more micro transit planning? So the most effective form of transit is frequent fixed route transit. And that is for all sorts of trips. That, that is true for going to the grocery stores as much as it is true for going to work. And, and so I feel like ultimately, the core of what transit is good at is running transit vehicles in straight lines frequently all day. And the more people can take advantage of that, the better a transit system is. I think the micro transit discussion really happens on the edges. Uh, I think every city has some bus routes that, you know, squiggle through a neighborhood once an hour, um, make taking a really circuitous route. I can see an on-demand service kind of serving that. Um, I think we found in Houston, for example, that low density, low income neighborhoods, that can be a really good solution. It doesn't save you money, but it may actually make some of those trips better. Um, but ultimately, I, I think one of the ways the transit industry has gotten lost over the last decade is a, a focus on mini shuttles and Uber and Lyft and all sorts of other things is sort of under the bucket of last mile solutions. Um, and what I would say is we already have the perfect last mile technologies and we know how to use them. And those are sidewalks and bikes. Um, and that is the solution um, to nearly every transit access question. And that does mean we have to rethink urban form. It does mean we have to rethink how streets work. And it means we have to invest in things like sidewalks and bike lanes. Um, but if we get that right, that will way, work way better for getting people to good transit than a little autonomous shuttle bus will. Thank you. Um, I think you've partially answered this one question from Francis DeAndrea from Hickok Coal Architects. How much of the issues with US Transit is due to the political will or out of control costs or the 
you're linked. I think you've talked a little bit about political will and, and to, especially regarding transit as a priority. What about the cost side? Um, okay, so, I mean, a lot of this comes down to political will. So just underline that, but um, the cost issue is a major one. Um, and what we know in the United States is that the cost we have to build transit is several times that of other places. You can look at subway costs that are 10 times what other places have. And we have no good excuses for these. New York City was saying, for example, that um, our, our subways are expensive because our city is really dense. Well, why are they more expensive than Tokyo then? Or our subways are expensive because our city is really historic. So why are they more expensive than Athens? It simply makes no sense. Our, our, our transit infrastructure is dramatically overpriced. And the problem is if your subway costs 10 times as much per mile, it means you can only build a 10th as much subway. It means a lot fewer people will benefit from that. Um, and there's been some good recent research on this. There's been some good work on this. I think it's something we need to concertedly push on. One of the interesting things you realize when you dig into it is that, you know, th there's a lot of reasons for this detailed issues of fire code. Um, some of them are that a lot of the elected officials involved, frankly, see transit as a construction jobs program. So they don't really care how many miles of subway you're getting for $10 billion because they're getting $10 billion worth of construction activity. Um, and you know, construction firms and consulting firms can look at it the same way. So I think that is a real problem that the political incentive isn't there. Um, and a lot of that cost also has to do with minimizing inconvenience to cars. Um, the question of how you build a subway line, do you dig up the entire street and do cut and cover, or do you send a boring machine underneath? And nowadays we send the boring machine, namely because we don't want subway construction to get in the way of cars. Um, and likewise, even for building at grade, are you gonna widen that street to fit a new light rail line in, or are you going to reduce the number of traffic lanes to fit in that light rail? It's all a different form of political well. Like, are we willing to actually make some hard decisions in order to make transit lines a lot more economical? And, and I think that is really worth focusing on as well. Thank you. You guys may hear my dog barking in the background here. Can't stop her right now. Uh, we have a hand raise, uh, Daniel Baranowski. What's your question, Daniel? Hi, thanks for calling on me. Um, I'm in my lunch break downtown, as you can see. Um, the question I have is, it seems like one of Metro's biggest issues here in DC is that there's just sort of this intractable mismanagement and a lack of safety culture that's like really buried deep within the agency. What, what are strategies to fix that? And, and did what Boston did with their fiscal management control board, do did, did you think that was successful or not and why? I don't think we can say at this point whether the FMCP in Boston has been successful because I think success on this actually often comes over longer time frames. Um, I mean, Boston's issues are very different. Boston's issues have a lot to do with really old infrastructure. But I will say, I think one of WMATA's problems is that like a lot of WMATA didn't really realize it was aging. Um, that I think in a lot of ways, the region still thought of this as a sparkling brand new subway, um, rather than parts of it now being close to 50 year old infrastructure. Like that's a big difference. Um, and that when you have 50 year old infrastructure, you need to be investing in maintenance and in rehab a way, in a way that you don't need to for brand new infrastructure. So I think the region was slow to make that shift and was slow to allocate funding accordingly. I think BART in San Francisco did a much better job of having their board and their senior management realize how important state of good repair was earlier and BART never let things get as bad as DC let them get. Um, so I'd say that's one big issue. But beyond that, it really is safety culture. And this is where I wish I had better answers here, but it comes down to what every employee and what every supervisor does every moment of their day and how they think about their jobs. And when that 
breaks, when you don't have those frontline employees feeling valued, when you don't have those frontline employees seeing themselves as what keeps this system safe and functioning, um, those are those are the kind of moments where bad decisions get made, where things don't get checked, where things get overlooked. Um, and that takes a complete cultural change. And that's not easy. And I mean, the, 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 there are people who specialize in thinking about organizational change. So I'll leave it to them as to like what the tools there are there. But I am really deeply worried that that is the problem at WMATA, that the way the agency thinks about safety all throughout the organization is just kind of broken. Um, I'll say the other thing that is also worth noting in here is that our transit procurement practices in the United States are also a real problem. Um, experiences in Houston, it actually has to do with things like how we do vehicle procurements. Um, there's a very good reason why we do, why we have to do opening procurements with bidding because before we did that, there was an immense amount of corruption, but it also means that transit agencies can't do what private businesses do. In Houston, for example, we had our first generation of our light rail vehicles, which were just incredibly good vehicles. They were incredibly reliable. They were easy to maintain. They had done a great job on the system and now we needed to buy more. If we were a private enterprise, we would just would have called up manufacturer, we just would have called up Siemens and said, we want some more of those. Um, but as a public agency, we weren't allowed to do that. And we had to put it out to bid, which meant we ended up with a second fleet of different rail cars that turned out to have a set of problems that the Siemens cars didn't and that didn't get delivered on time. And, you know, so, so it may be worth doing some thinking too about how we do procurement. And it's definitely worth doing some thinking about how we're specking the systems. I mean, it's stupid in hindsight that we somehow managed to build multiple subway heavy rail metro systems from the 70s through the 90s and basically made them more or less incompatible with each other. So they all have separate custom vehicles to custom fit those systems. The more interchangeable this stuff is, the less you end up with, you know, 7000 series is a custom designed vehicle that was, has been built only for one agency once. And that's the kind of thing where bugs turn up as opposed to if you're buying something that's already been proven across the, across the country. Sounds like the Defense Department. All right, um, here going in a different direction um, from uh, Warner Notch, the number one comment I hear for, for not taking public transit is that, the, is that the driver wants to retain their independence how to present public transit as an alternative when folks want absolute control of their commute or think they have control? I mean, I, I will say that one of my favorite things about taking transit in DC is the independence it gets me. And when I have, for whatever reason, been forced to drive a car within the limits of the district, I've just found it a miserable experience. Um, and, and, and I would argue that in good walkable places, transit is actually freedom. That, that feeling of, I don't have to worry about where to put my car is actually liberating. Um, but I will say, I think for the most part, Americans actually make logical decisions about transit. I think most Americans who don't take transit aren't taking transit because transit doesn't actually work for them, which means we haven't provided good enough transit. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, we have to make the actual experience of transit better. We have to be out there sort of promoting it, getting people to try it. But fundamentally, we need to make transit better. I, I, what we're lacking in transit is not good marketing. What we're lacking in transit is good transit. As someone who's terrified driving through Northern Virginia in a car, I'm always glad when I can take Metro instead. Uh, same with I-95 and Amtrak. Um, we have a question from uh, one of our elected officials who are attending, Mayor Bridget Newton has a question um, about, it's the debate about removing road lanes on an arterial uh, versus adding lanes to put in a bus rapid transit. Uh, we're thinking about Rockville Pike Route 355 in Montgomery County through Rock, the city of Rockville here. Which works best to increase transit riders versus single occupant vehicles? And I'd probably add to this, how do you sell it? Yeah, no, I mean, clearly, 
In terms of transit ridership, not widening the street will be better in lots of ways. I mean, first of all, it makes getting to, it makes the experience of getting to the transit better if there's fewer lanes in the way. Um, it probably means you didn't have to tear down any buildings on both sides of the street, which means those buildings still exist as, as sources of ridership for that transit. And you saved a lot of money, which means you can build more transit with that money. So that, you know, if you repurposed a lane, you may have saved, I don't know, quarter of the cost. Um, and in that means you can make the thing 25% longer and you can serve more people. So from a transit standpoint, repurposing space is much better than widening a roadway. From a traffic standpoint, I mean, you will probably have somewhat more congestion if you repurpose the lane. But again, you're making transit better, so you will shift some people there. And secondly, the thing about traffic is, um, I always, it's, it's not like flooding. Um, when we think about flooding, like, you know, rain falls, rain falls from the sky, and then we have to size storm sewers to fit that rainfall. And how much rain falls from the sky is a given, which means if your storm sewer is clogged, you need a big, bigger sewer. Traffic isn't like that because the thing is when we create more capacity on the roadways, it actually leads to more people driving. When we create less capacity on the roadways, it actually leads to fewer people driving. Um, and so what we have found in these cases where you repurpose a lane, it's not even that this traffic ends up going to other streets. A lot of that traffic actually simply disappears. Um, and I think a lot of the traffic concerns are overblown and a lot of the roadways where we have these concerns, it's not actually number of lanes that's a limiting issue. It's things like all of the turns in and out of driveways, it's the signals at the intersections. Um, so I think we just need to like not be scared to say we can repurpose urban space. We've done it before. That's how we got a lot of these car lanes. We can do it again. Um, but I have real sympathy for the elected officials who, who have to stand up there and propose that because I realize it is not an easy thing to propose. And I realize you will get yelled at a lot as you propose that. Because I think that in a lot of ways, the public doesn't understand the fundamentals of how transportation actually functions. Um, which to me, one of the big themes of the book is the way we get better transit is by actually having smarter conversations around transit. And I wish that was something transit agencies were actually better at doing. Um, so if we can figure out a way to set up that conversation and actually explain our thinking, I, I think you can get the public along with you. Thank you. You're reminding me of why we're gonna to have to have you back a couple of times in front of different audiences, particularly of uh, a full set of elected officials. I've got time for maybe one more, maybe two more questions. I'll try to combine one. Here's an oldie but goodie. Um, how do you determine whether to install light rail versus BRT is one preferable to the other? And, and that's from Paul. And there was an earlier question from Jason talking about Colfax in Denver and how long it's taken to get a BRT there. Um, you may be able to touch on that. But the first is the light rail versus BRT, which doesn't answer the classic question in less than a minute. <laughs> it doesn't matter nearly as much as people think it does. I know plenty of people on Twitter who think BRT is always better. I know plenty of people who think light rail is always better. I think they're both wrong. Um, there are some narrow technical things. I will say with current technology, light rail is somewhat easier for we than BRT is. That's an advantage. I, I think that's actually something which can be fixed by technology in the fairly near term. Um, light rail fundamentally has more capacity than BRT given the same space. If you have one lane in each direction, you can get more people through there on a light rail train than you can on buses, assuming that you want to give signal priority, which you absolutely want to. So at a certain level of ridership, the answer becomes you need light rail in order to have the capacity that you want. Um, but I think a lot more times it's actually local issues that are relevant. Um, if you're a small system, you may already have a bus garage. So BRT is easier than doing a brand new maintenance facility. If you're extending an existing line, obviously what that existing line is matters. Um, you can think about how you fit into an overall network. You can think about if you have existing facilities like say HOV lanes, you could convert into bus lanes, in which case a BRT might be able to extend to more places than the comparable rail line would. To me, that what you do is you figure out which corridor you want to serve, you figure out 
what kind of service you need and what kind of capacity you need in that corridor. And then you pick the technology that does it the best. You don't start the discussion with technology. And one last question, how do we make it easy, Patricia? How do we make it easy to do transit easy to use for people in wheelchairs or using wheeled walkers? So, I mean, it's a big deal. Um, I mean, and, and obviously in place like New York City, the like the lack of elevators and stations is just a huge problem that the experience of navigating New York in a wheelchair, is a totally different experience. Um, I think there's a lot we can do though, in terms of station design, vehicle design. I mean, if you're on a modern light rail system, you can see how well it works, but it seems like, is the doorway wide enough? Is there enough space inside? One of the things I love that I saw in Germany, for example, example is buses with all door boarding so you can tap your fare card at any door where they had the rear door of the bus be extra wide with an extra large empty floor area inside which was so much better for wheelchairs and strollers because you didn't have to navigate around the driver and the front wheel wells to get in like I think that's a great practice I think we could do a lot more of having um, curb heights at bus stops would be really close to bus floor heights so that a really short little bridge ramp that can automatically extend can get you across. Um, and this goes to another point, the people designing and making transit decisions ought to reflect who uses it. So frankly, part of the answer is we need more people who are in wheelchairs. We need more people who have taken kids through cities to be part of this design process and helping us make these decisions. Terrific. Thank you, Christoph. Let's have a hand for Christoph. You can put the hand emoji up there. Um, I want to wrap up here. Um, there's a call to action in this. Uh, um, we should be inspired by what we've heard. We should also now head out and get fighting on this stuff. Um, we still have uh, some infrastructure bills at the federal level. Now, the Fed bipartisan infrastructure bill itself is pretty disappointing when it comes to transit versus roads. They kept to the 80-20 split despite um, some best efforts by many groups. We are seeking a $10 billion plus up in the reconciliation bill to go to transit with flexibility for operations. Also tied up in the infrastructure bill though is the 150 million a year for federal dollars uh, for Metro, for WMATA, for their rehabilitation of their system. Once the bill is passed, there's gonna be a ton of money for roads that we'd like to flex to transit. Um, we're all gonna have to watchdog in Maryland, DC and Virginia how that money's spent. Please stay with us on that. Please help us push Metro and the regional agent, other local agencies for bus transformation, including network redesign and dedicated lanes. Realize we've got just nine years to slash emissions that contribute to climate change. So that means TOD and transit are a big part of the solution. And lastly, if you live in Virginia or Greenbelt College Park Laurel, and I may be missing one, uh, you've got a chance to vote and you should absolutely vote, please. Our democracy depends on it. Uh, election day is coming up on Tuesday, November 2nd, a week from today. So get out there, help us fight for transit. One last hand, good big hand for Christoph, and we promise to get him back here and be sure to buy his book at Island Press. So thank, thank you, you all. all. Thanks, Christoph.